Well, I, I want to welcome you all, both online and here in the room, to the 2022 uh, David Somerville Lecture. Uh, David Somerville was an archbishop here in the city of Vancouver. He was also a professor at the Vancouver School of Theology and Pastoral Theology, a man uh, who people remember with great affection. Uh, he funded this series, which is both a lecture and a retreat for the school community tomorrow uh, with a legacy gift that he gave to the school. And we're very grateful uh, for that legacy gift. Uh, tonight, I want to introduce to you Julian Davis-Reed, who is an artist theologian. He uses words and music to invite us into the restful life we're created to live. And if there was ever a time we need to be invited into that restful life that we've been created to live, it's right about now. Uh, Julian is a pianist, a producer, a composer. He's a founding member of the Jazz Electronic Fusion Group, the Juju Exchange, and they host contemplative retreats called Notes of Rest. Julian has performed and spoken throughout the country and around the world, and he's released three studio albums. I believe some of them are for sale there at the back if you'd like to pick those up. Uh, the latest being a solo piano project, Rest Assured. He's worked with Chance the Rapper, Jennifer Hudson, Peter Cottontail, and uh, Derek Hodge. He's also has been an artist in residence at uh, the City Seminary of New York. He earned his MDiv at Chandler School of Theology at Emory University, and he has a BA in philosophy from Yale University. He and his wife, Carmen, who is from Vancouver, right? Yes, born here, yes. Um, they're based in their hometown of Chicago. And uh, the lecture this evening is an eschatology of rest, music and contemplation as care for a restless world. And just before we ask Julian to begin, um, I remind you that we meet this evening on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And we are grateful for their care for this land through the years. Julian. Thank you. It is so good to be here. Thank you for welcoming to me to your school and more importantly to your country. I bring greetings from Chicago, Illinois. And so thank you, Reverend Dr. Topping. And I would also be remiss if I didn't say thank you to my grandfather in love, Akong, who made the initial connection between me and Vancouver School of Theology. So it's just a joy to be here with you, joy to be here with all of you to think about and experience rest. Now, I have lived in various places, Chicago and New Haven and also Atlanta, but there was a time, a story that I wanted to share about a trip I took to Charleston, South Carolina that really starts our time for tonight. Notes of rest is a practice of contemplation and creativity that moves us towards the rest we were created to receive. And so tonight we're gonna to talk about a concept called eschatology, about the end times, about a new world that's beginning as an old world ends. And to do that right, I have to take us to Charleston, South Carolina. Now, I don't know if people here have heard of Charleston, it's south of the border, and way south actually, uh, over on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. But perhaps you've heard of it because in 2015, there was a horrific shooting there. Dylan Roof was a white young man who came into the church, was invited in for the time of Bible study one night, he spent time with this black congregation, historic black congregation, one of the oldest in the South. He spent time with them. And then at the end of the study, he shot up the church and killing nine. My wife and I, Carmen, went to Charleston, South Carolina a year after that shooting. During that time, there was also all kinds of arson happening in the area. Black churches were being burned down throughout the South. It was a time of great pain and worry. And yet, at this Bible study, a year later, almost to the day from Dylan Roof's atrocious acts, there was Bible study again. The church was open, we were there, and not only was it open, not only were black folk in there having Bible study, there were also white people there again. In Bible study, sharing, talking, praying, and holding hands. During that time, I was blown away. This was so close to such a tender time, the memorial for the nine who had been massacred was still on the wall. And here we were again, holding hands in this profound 
mixed community. This brought me to this deep, deep idea that I've heard in Black church settings many a time, which is this joy, this love, this rest I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. That line comes from the gospel singer, Shirley Caesar. And she is a profound theologian in her own right. Now in her song, she just says joy and love. I add to it rest. Because what I saw in that moment, what I felt with Carmen, my wife, I felt this deep rest that couldn't have come from any just natural place. Because they were still mourning viscerally the death of the nine and yet we're open again to having people come in. I saw moments like this throughout my time in the South, living in Atlanta for four years before moving back North to Chicago. And during that time in the South, I experienced time and again, this sentence, this joy, this love, this rest, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. It became an invitation for me to think about the legacy, the heritage, the inheritance I had and what it meant to be people of rest in a deeply, restless world. And so one idea, one conclusion that emerged for me as a result of this time was this, that Black Christian witness has shown that God's coming rest is present for us to glimpse now in the resurrected Jesus. We're going to spend tons of time looking at songs that reflect this from Black life. We're going to spend time listening. I have a whole concert plan for you, so stay tuned. Also, hi to those on Zoom. Stay tuned, reminding me that we're in this new era of tuning in, literally. So thank you for tuning in on Zoom. But stay tuned, all y'all in present uh, form, too. We're going to have a grand old time. But this sentence for me is part of the entree into what it is I want us to talk about tonight. Because this joy, this peace that I possess and that I want to share from, that I've experienced in person in South Carolina, that I've experienced and able to share from, this is what the coming reign of God is all about. A reign filled with deep joy and hope. One that shows that death is ultimately swallowed up. Death, where is your sting? And yet it's not one naive to the pains and the macabre of today. And so from that place, before we get into the, all the big old thick words, eschatology this and heaven that, before we get into all of that, I love for us to play, pray and center ourselves as we begin this experience of moving with words and music into the rest that we were created for.
God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the goodness that surpasses understanding. Thank you for sitting with us with all of our notes of restlessness and rest. I pray that this time can be one of learning, of witness, of intrigue, of curiosity, and of peace. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so there's more where that came from, but also you've been warned, we're about to dig deep into a theologian called Jürgen Moltmann. Jürgen Moltmann was a big time theologian from the 20th century who was a prisoner of war and responded to the gruesomeness that he experienced in Europe with powerful theology that was ultimately pointing towards liberation and pointing to a world beyond this one, one that he had to believe in because of what he was going through in the horrors of war. And so I'm gonna read a passage from him that helps ground our sense of rest. He's talking here about the in-breaking power, what he calls even the in-pouring, the in-streaming power of Christ from a world beyond that's coming here, that's coming close. This is a passage from his big old tome on eschatology, on the end times, about the end world and the new beginning called the coming of God. So hear this passage, see the words that are bolded, and pay attention because we're going to come back to these things often. Every living organism experiences the time in which it lives in the rhythm of its inward and outward movements, intention and relaxation. For Israel, the general eschatological expectation of the future in which the whole earth will be full of God's glory could be experienced practically in the weekly Sabbath, in the Sabbath or seventh year, and in every 49th year, the year of Jubilee. In the rhythm of the Sabbath, which healingly interrupts the flux of time, God's rest is experienced. The rest which, as well as being the goal of creation, will also be the end of history. The Sunday worship of Christians too was originally and is essentially the eschatological celebration of Christ's resurrection in the end streaming powers of the future world. Every Sunday points beyond itself to the first day of the new creation on which the dead will be raised into the life of the future world. Now, this is an amazing sermon, if I ever heard one, admittedly in academic jargon. But here's my version of it as it relates to us now. Note, note the words that are in bold here, tension and relaxation. That's a phrase that's gonna come up a lot. Why? Because we hear tension and relaxation or what I like to call tension and resolution all the time in music. And what I also note here is the word rhythm, which speaks to the rhythms that we have in our lives, rhythms of restlessness, but then also the rhythms of restfulness that God is bringing. And then you also see here in the middle that what he's really focusing on is that as we move towards this new creation that God is bringing, that Sabbath, this time consecrated for rest and pause is a weekly rhythm that's connected to these other rhythms in scripture that allows us to attend to a life to come. And so here's my version summarizing and taking a little further what Motman is talking about. We can choose to listen to God's in-breaking rhythm of rest over against the world's seductive, destructive rhythms of restlessness. Music and contemplation are ways of practicing that listening in order to care for this restless world. I'll read that again so we can really sit with that. We can choose to listen to God's in-breaking rhythm of rest over against the world's seductive, destructive rhythms of restlessness. Music and contemplation are ways of practicing that listening in order to care for this restless world. Now we're gonna unpack this thesis statement throughout the whole night, but I wanna pause here and while Motman is still fresh in our minds to return to what was happening for Israel. Israel ends up having Sabbath given to them after they've come out of slavery for hundreds of years and as they live in the midst of constant warfare. One thing we have to remember about ancient Israel is that they sat right on this really tender area in the middle of the Mediterranean that was constantly a place for war. You couldn't have picked a worse place to put yourself because it was here where you had Egypt to the south that would want to expand. And you also then had in the north, Assyria and the Hittites and all kinds of ites that were coming down the Babylonians and anybody who wanted to control that area, where, they, where, they, where would they have to come? right through Israel. So these cats were always at war. 
And so they're always in this state of panic. There's some time relief, but for the most part, they're often fighting. And yet, as Moltmann notes for us, we see throughout their scriptures, take time to rest, take time to receive, to be still. And so we get encouragement for where we are now, as Dr. Topping said at the top of the time, that in the midst of all of our restlessness now, these aren't tone deaf lines coming to us from scripture about taking time to rest. These are coming from people who've learned the hard way what it means to have to rest amidst restlessness. Now, in the second half, you notice these two words that are from the title, music and contemplation. And you may be wondering, why is he going there? Well, the quick answer before I get into the more theological ones is that that's what I do. I love to contemplate, have a conversation with me for three minutes and you'll see. And I just love to sit and reflect and be still and be quiet. I also love the contemplation that happens communally. Like we just saw in music, I love that. And then again, as a musician, that is also a place where I experience rest. So those are the personal autobiographical reasons, but of course they're heftier ones. The first is this, that it cultivates receptivity to God's rhythm. Music and contemplation both cultivate receptivity to God's rhythm. Music is a place that's not just for entertainment. It's also a place that forms us, that teaches us, that can be therapeutic. It can be a space that allows us to receive what we need, receive in the midst of our pain, sounds that intrigue, that provoke, that calm, that even give new life. And so music is a practice by which we can become more receptive to the future. Now, this is in general the case, but in my case, as an improvisational musician, what's also the case is that music is constantly being created in the moment before me, as well as before y'all. Those two songs I played, Thank You, and also Amazing Grace, those are well-known songs from my neck of the woods. And maybe some of y'all have heard Amazing Grace before. And, and yet, even though that's how the songs generally go, I didn't know how the songs were going to end. There's this pianist, Keith Jarrett. I love how he puts it. He says that he's a great classical player, but he's also a great jazz musician. And Keith Jarrett says, as a pianist, he doesn't know how the song is gonna end. So he's as much a spectator as anybody else. I love that idea. And that's part of the great honor and joy of being an improvisational musician. It's also part of the sheer terror because you're creating kind of nakedly in the moment and people are able to assess right in front of you, is that a good composition or not? And so it allows you to become more receptive to what you don't know. That's what I'm trying to get at. We don't know how the song's gonna end. Music is constantly pushing you deeper into mystery, especially music without words. There's a great theologian, Jeremy Begbie, who talks about this, who says that music, well, what's that mean on its own? We can't really say. Don Sayers is another theologian who says, when you hear something, you can say it sounds like something, but you can't really say what that is. Language at some point stops to be all that helpful for describing sound. It has a world all its own. It has a sense of referentiality internal to itself. Beautiful. Now, when you add words and you start singing, you don't want to hear me sing. But if you add words and you start singing, you start to then get a different kind of meaning. But music on its own, sound, qua sound, sound on its own, you have to always be adding meaning to it. And so what Jeremy Begbie is getting at and Sellers is that there's a mystery that we're ineluctably drawn into that allows us to see more of what music is saying. And in so doing, creates in us the kind of posture towards the receptivity of a mysterious God coming to us. God is coming and drawing us in. Who is this Jesus? The demons knew, the Pharisees thought they knew, the disciples, definitely in Mark's gospel, thought they knew, but they often were getting it wrong and yet they stuck around. Who is this Jesus? I wanna learn the messianic secret. I don't know what all is happening in this guy's head in his life, but I wanna follow him. I wanna know what he's talking about. This is the story of the gospels of being drawn forward into a mystery. Jesus was doing a musical act by creating sounds with his way of living that drew people in, making them more receptive to the world to come. God's rhythm, a rhythm that was based on a kind of deep justice, a rhythm that was based on death being swallowed up. This is what Jesus was about. And this is what music can help create in all of us. It can train us to be about this.
So that's why it is, I'd say that for music. In terms of contemplation, contemplation also allows us to attend to what God has for us. When we sit and we pause, when we focus on our breathing, when we pray, when we just even contemplate who God is, paying attention to who God is, it allows us to be, become more receptive to the mystery of God. This can be done in all kinds of ways. And we practice some of that tonight. And what I love is that you can see in music and contemplation, playing music, creating, and then also attending, you can see those joined together so beautifully in Black music. It's not the only place, of course, but it's a place that I call home. And so I'll be sharing from my home tonight with you all. And so that's the first reason why I focus on music and contemplation as means by which we can attend to the rhythms of God. The last thing I'll say about music is that when you're playing music, I'll, ex I'll explain in a second, playing. But when you play music, you know when things sound rushed. You know when the rhythm sounds off. So I'll explain. And you'll just grate yourself because this is going to sound dissonant. Let's go back to Amazing Grace. Annoying. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to listen to that. Maybe you do for a second, or maybe if you're into Philip Glass or all those kinds of cats, maybe. But for the most part, people aren't trying to listen to music that has such a dissonant sense of rhythm. We know, even if we don't know the first thing about music theory, we know when it sounds like there's flow, when there's peace, when there's assurance, and we know when it sounds like somebody's out to lunch. And all you need to do is play with a drummer who speeds up, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Or I don't know if y'all ever go to church with a tambourine, but I say, man, the tambourine is the most lethal instrument. The most lethal, because if somebody gets the spirit or they think that God's on their side and they start tapping, Lonnie knows, and they're out of rhythm, Lord help us all. Because their sound is cutting through everything and people are like, am I clapping with the choir or with this cat who's over here? <laughs> so, you know, tambourine, next time you see it, pray. Just pray. <laughs> pray that God knows what's going on and that the person is anointed, because otherwise the rhythm, if it mismatches, you're in for a long time. So, so all to say that music teaches us even in how we respond to the aesthetics. The aesthetics are not just about what makes us feel good. It's not just about what holds our attention. Aesthetics also, the study of beauty, it also can show us something about how the world feels, right? The world has a rhythm to it. And the beautiful thing is that as Moltmann is talking is that God is converting our sense of rhythm from this world to God's incoming one. And so music, I love it. I not only love to play it, but I love to see it as a site for education, for a place to shape us, to mold us, to help us realize something about ourselves that may even go beyond what we can say. But there's a second thing that you'll gather from what I've been talking about with Mother Emmanuel, which is that music and contemplation are means, are modes of moving us towards the rest, are modes of moving us towards the kind of peace that God has for us that everybody can access. This is vitally important to me. Now we can talk about sleep and I'll mention sleep later because these are themes of rest that we have. But the modes that we have to move towards rest, sadly, they're not all made equal. Sleep inequity is a huge issue. In my context in America, working age black adults get the worst sleep out of everybody. Thomas Jefferson, one of our famed presidents, number three in the US, he was on record for saying, don't let black slaves sleep a lot because they don't need it. They don't really have a mind, so they don't need to actually recuperate like white folk, get them up, keep them working. We also see similar patterns in prison where people who sleep, um, the prisoners who sleep, they have to get up at different times for breakfast, sometimes 4 a.m., sometimes 7 a.m. These are ways of keeping people off kilter. So even though sleep is something that is basic and needed for all, it is not something that comes equally to all. There are other ways we could talk about rest, vacations, sabbaticals. These are modes and methods of rest that are often allotted for the privileged, those who are able to determine their schedules or who are offered a day off from vacation. And even with the great resignation that's happening these days where people are moving away from jobs and saying, no, enough is enough. Even with the surge in unions in the States, the reality is that there are a lot of people the world over who are not able to access rest through these modes. But what my ancestors showed me in the slave ship on plantation is that music 
even if you take away the central instrument to me, which in the case of my ancestors was the drum, even if you take that away, I still got a song. And they use this song as a way to cut through the mess and the malarkey, to cut through the macabre of all that was happening during slavery and since. And so music is something that we always have access to. You can always hum. You can always hum. You remember that too, I'll mention that in a bit. Contemplation also, our attention. You don't have to tell any advertiser this. Our attention, what we hold in front of us, what we behold, that is up for grabs every second of every day. Why? Because people know that they can buy that. They can buy that with advertising on social media. They can use it in all kinds of ways to keep us distracted. Steve Jobs said that his goal was to create a device that nobody would leave home without. Well, seems like he did his job with the iPhone or sorry for Android users in the place. That too though, but the kind of addictions that we have to technology, these are ways of pointing to the fact that all of us have attention and yet so often it is up for grabs, not in our control and mismanaged. But what we also see is that we can always focus. We can always choose to focus and contemplation is a way of doing that. Be it in the meditative practices that you know from monks, be it in music or other forms of communal attention keeping, there are all kinds of ways that we can pay attention. No matter your class, your race, no matter how close you are to power or how far away you are from it, you always have the choice of attention. And that's why music and contemplation are so important because we can choose to attend to the God of rest and we can choose to make music that moves us towards rest, even if we're not allotted a day off. Now, like I said, I want to come back to music and the power of it and the way it's able to be ubiquitous. This is a beautiful passage from a profound theologian and contemplative. Her name is Dr. Barbara Holmes. Hear these words as she talks about what happened with the moan. So in the slave ship, people were dealing with pain. And one thing that happened was that in the hull, we started to moan. Mm, mm, mm. That was happening in all kinds of ways on ships. And you hear that in black folk all the time, still to this day, you hear the moan, you hear the hum. And these are ways that we've carried down the sound, the way of responding with music and contemplation to the deep pain that we were in. What I love about what Barbara Holmes does is that she turns contemplation on its head. Oftentimes when we hear the word contemplation, we can think of, um, <laughs> we can think of being a white man in the forest somewhere with our eyes closed and silent and still, alone. Henry Nouwen, William McNamara, all kinds of cats, right? These are people we often look to. This is great. This is a form of contemplation, but it's not the only kind. And Barbara Holmes, a Black woman, aware of the power of contemplation, but also aware of how often it's seen through a Eurocentric lens, she widens the aperture to look at how Black folk communally contemplate, which is different than silent alone, that Eurocentric contemplation favors. And so with that in mind, listen to this passage as she looks at what was contemplative about what was happening on slave ships. Contemplation usually occurs at the leisure of one who has the freedom to decide how to enter into the divine presence. It is purportedly the epitome of peace and repose. However, contemplation can also be a displacement of the ordinary, a paradigm shift that becomes a temporary refuge when human suffering reaches the extent of spiritual and psychic dissolution. So again, why focus on music and contemplation? Because I want us to focus on what can be possible no matter your state in life. If you're on Zoom, no matter what you're going through, whether you have access to sleep in a timely fashion or you have access to peace in your home, you have access to music, you have access to contemplation. And this is the text that was from Joy Unspeakable, Contemplative Practices of the Black Church. And so here is how the rest of tonight is going to flow. I'm going to talk through five different kinds of rest. Right now, all we've talked about are the vehicles that I want to focus on, music and contemplation, and the fact that God's incoming reality that Christ has done in the resurrection is one that we can pay attention to. We can pay attention with our rhythms to that, with music, with contemplation. And now I want to talk about the five kinds of rest. So scripture talks about rest in various ways, but there are five kinds that show up that I'm curious about. You'll get those in a second. And then, like I said, there's a concert. 
So I'm gonna play and just let you experience and reflect on questions that I put on the screen that allow you to process where you are with your rest and your restlessness, that gives you space with the music as accompaniment to go before God, to use music and contemplation as means by which you can discern how rest might become more prominent in your life. This last word, banks, speaks to how when you have this time of being caught up in God's presence, when you're contemplative, it's like you're being in a river. But after that, when you come out and talk about it, Lonnie, how was that for you? That's like being on the river banks. So we're going to come out of the waters after the concert onto the banks. You'll have a chance to talk with each other. Now, introverts, you're getting plenty of warning, right? This is in an hour, so don't worry. <laughs> but at that time, I invite you to turn to your neighbor and talk. And then we'll have time to talk together with the most illustrious mic runner you will ever find and Dr. Topping helping us out. And so that is what's going to happen for the rest of our time, the flow for the evening. So this is the first kind of rest that we talk about. Now, this happens a lot in scripture where you talk about work and the pause from it. And there's all kinds of scriptures that relate to that. And we were just talking about how the Sabbath was given as a day wherein people were able to focus on pausing from work. Now, this is a kind of rest, but it's also a kind of restlessness. And we'll talk about this more later, but what we see here, just at the intro, is that we love overworking. And sadly, also many people are underworked. And we have these really lopsided, unfair systems whereby some are enshrined, the Steve Jobs of the world, of working themselves to a pulp. And sadly, this isn't any better in the church. In fact, the term workaholism allegedly was first used to describe pastors. And so this issue is one that is rife throughout our life in faith and the world writ large. We'll talk about that more. So work can be a place for rest, but it's also a place of deep restlessness. What we also see in scripture is that God talks to Joshua and, and Joshua talks to the people of Israel and says, when we get into the promised land, there'll be rest for more. The land will have rest for more. And so I take that idea, and it's so provocative, and you see this idea elsewhere in Scripture. Jesus before Pilate, for instance, where he pauses. Pilate wants to ensconce Jesus all the more in the war between Rome and the Pharisees, and is Rome going to squash the Jews, and all of this enmeshment and entanglement, and all this political warfare, religious strife. And what does Jesus do? He gets silent, says nothing. We see Jesus here showing a kind of rest from war, from conflict. We'll talk about that more because of course, on the flip side of war or rest from it is constant warmongering. And in my country, you don't have to go far to look for that. Now the next is sleep. And I'll do the cousin to it, which is death. We see both of these in scripture where sleep is a place for rest, also a place for restlessness. For instance, Jesus on the boat in Matthew eight, master, the storms are coming. Don't you care? Don't you care that we're dying? And yet Jesus doing that in sleeping is actually showing the kind of faithfulness present in the Psalter, Psalm 3 and Psalm 4 of resting in God's presence. We'll talk about that more later. Now, the cousin of sleep is death. A very famous rap line in American music. Death, in this case, is speaking to how we can actually embrace the end of life. And of course, Jesus shows that. But then also we see in the Old Testament, King David, before he dies, and it says throughout the history of the kings, that when the kings come to die, they come to sleep with their fathers, sleep with their ancestors. Before he dies, he comes and he gives Solomon this wisdom about how to take over the kingdom, the united monarchy, for the time that he was going to reign after David. And we see him embrace death, but then we also see people run from death, not only in scripture, but certainly throughout life, in ways that lead to needless death for others. I'll talk about that more. There are going to be some really funny pictures for that one. So just get ready. Um, but death is a clear place for both rest and restlessness. And last but not least is purpose. We see in Hebrews 4, Jeremiah 6, that God talks about rest as a place that allows you repose for your soul as you move in the purpose God's called for you in your community. And yet we also know that when communities are out of whack, when they don't have a clear sense of purpose, that can be a place for deep restlessness. So work, war, sleep, death, purpose. Again, there are other ways to think about it, but I see these being five prominent ways rest is talked about in scripture. And certainly you can look at it over the course of history. So we're gonna talk about them and their antonyms, starting with work. 
And so here's a passage from a biblical scholar that you might have heard of. His name is Walter Brueggemann. And he does this deep work all throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And in this case, he's written this book called Sabbath as Resistance, in which he's talking about how the ways of the ancient Israelites, the Hebrews who kept Sabbath, these are ways of wisdom that we bear to keep now, that we should keep now. But this is a beautiful way where he talks about work and the restlessness thereof. And you have to remember that Brueggemann is often thinking about theology in terms of systems. And so what in this case he's talking about is a system of the market, a system predicated on deep restlessness. And of course, he's contrasting that with the system of restfulness that God sets up with the Sabbath, with forgiveness and all the laws that God gave Israel, such that they might keep a different way in the world versus the Pharaoh that had them working to the bone prior. So with that as backdrop, hear this passage from Brueggemann. The demands of market ideology depend on the generation of needs and desire that will leave us endlessly restless, inadequate, unfulfilled, and in pursuit of that which may satiate desire. The rat race of such predation and usurpation is a restlessness that issues inescapably in anxiety that is often at the edge of being unmanageable. When pursued vigorously enough, moreover, one is propelled to violence against the neighbor and eagerness for what properly belongs to the neighbor. A beautiful way. I mean, if you ever read this cat, this cat always cuts right to the bone talking about the issue. And in this case, Brueggemann is talking about how the market keeps us working, keeps us at this rat race keeps us constantly anxious about it, either for ourselves or for somebody else. Maybe it's for your children, maybe it's for your neighbor. Maybe they have more than you or they're gonna have more than you based on their projected finances. All kinds of ways that we're constantly embroiled in the restlessness that's predicated in the way we think about work now. Now this was then and now. Brueggemann is talking about what was happening now or what's happening now with market ideology but he'd make these beautiful connections to the way Pharaoh was anxious and thereby kept people working all the time, making bricks without straw. Another, and now a cat on the other, uh, on another tip, Pong, Alex Su Jung Kim Pong, talks about this beautiful way we talk about overwork in our culture. With a few notable exceptions, today's leaders treat stress and overwork as a badge of honor brag about how little they sleep and how few vacation days they take and have their reputations as workaholics carefully tended by publicists and corporate firms. Whether we embrace the idea that overwork is essential for productivity and creativity or reject it, we all are defined by it. Now, I don't know if this relates to you. It certainly is related to me in the past. You can just raise your toes. That's what we say in church. Just raise your toes if that relates to you. Um, and for me, this happened all the time in undergrad. Man. Carmen and I, now Carmen was better. So actually I can't, misery loves company. So I'm gonna leave my wife out of this. She was better at this than I was. But I would be like, man, I have 50 pages to write and I didn't sleep at all last night. And then somebody would try to one up me and say, man, well, I have 60 pages to write. And they were all due yesterday. And that was just parlance at perverted, like masochistic parlance at, at lunch. And we just seemed to love that. It was crazy, but it was part of the malady of the time. And so we're just constantly one-upping each other, trying to talk about how much work we had. And I know that this is something that is deeply embedded in American culture. And I know from what I've heard from Carmen, what I've seen up here, um, what I've even heard from Dr. Topping is that the constant going, this pace of life, needing more, is also something that is contending with here in this part of North America as well. And so I bring us back to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That this word that was used back then is so relevant now. Remembering the Sabbath day presumes that you're actually at risk of forgetting it. You don't say remember something if you already know it, right? Nobody tells me, at least right now, praise the Lord, to remember my name. Maybe one day that'll be different. But I still remember my name. Nobody tells you something to remember if you always remember it. What was happening with Moses here in this context as Israel was coming out of 400 years of having worked day in and day out, and by the end of it, making bricks without straw, Moses has to tell the people, remember, you don't work all the time now. Remember, you are defined differently. You are defined by the God who created in six and rested in one. And then if we go to Deuteronomy's version, you are defined by the God who liberated you from slavery. Remember, you are given a day to pause, to contemplate me, and to go back to Brueggemann, I mean, not Brueggemann, to go back to Moltmann 
to participate in the rhythm that would one day open into a rhythm for all creation, a rhythm of rest. Remember this, remember. And so the question I have for you here is, how does this restless rat race, however you want to define that, tempt you to ignore God's rhythm of rest? How does this restless rat race tempt you to ignore God's rhythms of rest? And again, this may be for you, it may be for your neighbor. I encourage you to think with that. You have more time to reflect on this later. Right now, I'm moving us into all the questions so that they can play with each other as I play during the concert. Now, sleep and death, like I said, are the cousins. And here it comes, here are the pictures. I've always loathed the necessity of sleep. Like death, it puts even the most powerful men on their backs. Now, does anybody, anybody know who this is? Does it look familiar? Yes, Francis Underwood, we have a winner. So this is the great, infamous, uh, fictional U.S. Senator Francis or Frank Underwood on the show House of Cards on Netflix, a crazy show about crazy politics. Okay, I love this picture of him saying this. I could ease, this is one of his like most well-known quotes. And it speaks so well to the kind of fear that we can have around sleep and around death. That when we sleep, <laughs> when we die, we're actually put on our backs. And of course, he's made to be a caricature of megalomaniac power. But what happens with him is something that happens in gradation for all of us, where we can really deny ourselves sleep as a result of what's happening in the world around us all the time. It used to be, now this is way before me, some of y'all can raise your toes on this. It used to be that things shut down at night and you couldn't access money at all at some point. The banks would just close. For all of my income earning years, I've been able to access it on the internet. I'm on that last cuss. I'm 31, so millennial. So I had some time before the internet. I know what it's like to read books for fun at the library, but I also know the internet and use it in school. So I'm the part of that weird hybrid generation. But all to say that there was this time when you could feel like the world would actually stop when you stop. And of course, we just get worse and worse. And in fact, we've lost significant amounts of sleep on average over the last century. There's a lot of research being done about this deep epidemic of sleep deprivation. To this point, now connected to this about death being also a problem, you can't make this stuff up. I'm getting on the plane to come here a couple of days ago, and this is what I see in Hudson News, which is the, the, the newsstand in the States. Old age is over. <laughs> and then if you get, you probably can't read the uh, fine print, but it says here, uh, get ready for the first anti-aging drugs and a visit with, immort with immortality's true believers designed for seniors that doesn't suck. You know, it's just, cra just crazy. And actually in the top right corner, it's almost as if this is a joke. It's literally called, I kid you not, the longevity issue. This is the longevity issue of the MIT Technology Review. Old age is over. There's so much that's so problematic about this that we're not even allowed to get old because this is something that clearly is meant to be weaker. This is a, a marginal status in society. And many have said that you can tell the soul of society based on how it treats its young and treats its elders. This kind of thinking is so prominent in a society where we don't sleep and thereby hasten death. And also where, because of how we're afraid, we treat so often the elderly in all kinds of unjust ways. And so the sleeplessness, the deathlessness that's present before us looks like this or looks like Frank Underwood being goofy. And this is just to remind us of that. Now, one thing I wanna know here from the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes is this other point. And this is playing on riffing on what Frank Underwood said. Thomas Hobbes was a political philosopher in England during the time of the monarchy, when the monarch was actually not just a figurehead, but had all the power. And he's writing this treatise called Leviathan in service to the power of the, the king. He wants to talk and justify the crown. And this is an age where there's tons of proliferation of all kinds of treatises throughout Europe and France and England and the like, where people are writing about the kinds of political systems that should take um, root. He's talking about absolute monarchy. And one thing he says in service of the monarchy is that we need it because at night we don't trust ourselves, which is why we lock our doors, because even the king can't defend himself when he sleeps. Take that forward. Doesn't that sound a little bit like Underwood and what Underwood was just saying? The king can't defend himself when he sleeps. As powerful as the absolute monarch is, not even the king can defend himself 
And so what Hobbes was saying back then was touching on this nerve that I see present now, that we can't defend ourselves. We know that there's salutary benefits to sleep, that you sort through memories and you get healthier and deal with trauma. But the reality is your life can cave in on you, as it has with people who have fallen asleep and never woke up. And this can so scare us because of how we relate to death. Leviathan was getting at something. The reality also is that in the moment, you can't make more. When you sleep, just like he was saying, it puts you on your back. You can't make more and you have to stop. All of these are antithetical to the ways of speeding up, producing more, constantly being relevant that we see now, which is why we see tons of people enshrining sleeping less than they need, and then also always trying to make death seem like the worst thing. Now we know that death has been swallowed up, which is why it's so relevant to come into passages like these. I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. This is a passage from Psalms 4, which again, Jesus embodies when Jesus on the boat in Matthew 8 sleeps amidst the storm. I will lie down and sleep in peace, the Psalter says, the psalmist says, for you alone, Lord, protect me. There's a kind of protection that allows us to see death for what it is, namely something that really can't keep us from God. And yet, because of what Christ has done, we are now converted into this new sense of time that can draw us into this new relationship to sleep and death. Now, and below the line, you see this beautiful spiritual. I know some people here have heard of the song, Give Me Jesus, powerful Negro spiritual, which I actually didn't know for a long time. Did everybody here know that? Was I just the last one to know? Some people, thank you. I see you, tie-dye. You're with me. So some, some people were ignorant with me. Uh, but for the longest, I didn't realize. And then my ma asked, at a very special moment in her life for me to play this song for, um, she's a pastor, United Methodist pastor in Chicago. She asked me to play a song for her at a special ceremony. And that's when I learned that the song was a Negro spiritual. This song is so profound. And you can think about it in the context of sleep and death. Recall what I said earlier from Thomas Jefferson, slaves don't need to sleep that much, get them up, get them working. This is just a glimpse into the horrors, into the hellish fate that so many experience in slavery. And yet, and yet, and yet, what do we see here in these lines? In the morning when I rise, which may be four in the morning, three in the morning, right? Because they didn't need to sleep that much, right? So you're bleary eyed. You can have all this world, give me Jesus. And then also it says at the end, when I come to die, which in the case of slavery in antebellum America, that could have been that day, right? You're singing that song. You don't know if you're going to sleep. You don't know if you're gonna even see your siblings. They may be sold down the river into another plantation. There is so much uncertainty, so much death always present. And yet in the midst of all that, they had the gall to come up with lyrics that said, give me Jesus. And so these are moments of music and contemplation that point to a life that is not of this world. Just like Shirley Caesar said earlier, the joy I have, the love I have, this world didn't give it, and this world can't take it away. A song like this is a deep testament to that enduring witness. And so here's a question for you. How can Jesus's coming rest inform your sleep rhythms and the rhythms of those in your care? Who do you care for and how do they sleep? One of the best questions I got growing up consistently from my dad was, hey, how'd you sleep last night? And when I was young, I always found that a weird question uh, to ask. But now the older I've gotten, I appreciate the wisdom. How'd you sleep was a deep way of taking care of me. The reason I use the word rhythm here is because sleep is something. And if you're an insomniac, I've been an insomniac before, you know, when you don't have that rhythm and you're in the rhythm of restlessness, it can be cruel, deeply cruel. In fact, people who've been tortured, sometimes they have yearned for sleep more than they've yearned for liberty. Just let me sleep. Because one way that we actually still torment in the US, in Guantanamo Bay, is that we wake you up throughout the night to not let you really get into deep sleep. Ironically, that works against the ability to actually get information from you but it's the cruelty that's obviously irrational. Even more than liberty, sometimes they just want to sleep. How can Jesus' coming rest, a rest that comes from a world where there will be more, no more death, allow you to sleep in this life? I don't have to figure it all out because I'm waiting on a life to come. Let's just sit with this question as you think about yourself and those in your care. Next, second to last is war. Now I'm gonna read a passage here from this powerful black critical thinker, Christina Sharp, who's talking about this instance of racial strife in the US. I want you to note that it ironically is happening at night, so I could have put in the sleep passage, but I put it here because I want you to think about what does it mean 
What's it mean for this to be a conflict that goes on and on and on? So hear this passage from Christina Sharp talking about this insane, sad story. On October 29, 2012, on Staten Island, New York, Glenda Moore looked for and was refused shelter during Hurricane Sandy. That particular refusal resulted in the drowning deaths of her sons, Connor and Brendan, aged two and four, and her condemnation by many as an unfit mother. What, they demand, was she doing out in that storm? What kind of mother was she? Not only that, but when the white man who denied her shelter was asked why he didn't open the door to that distraught black woman, he repeatedly pounded on it for help. He said that he did not see a black woman at all, but a big black man, and that he was forced, therefore, to spend the night with his back against the door to prevent entry and thereby his own violation. War is afoot. There's so many layers to this paragraph. So much pain, so many forms of conflict. The conflict of the earth and how that storm then led to death. We don't have to look any further than Hurricane Fiona and what's happening, wreaking havoc in the Caribbean and all that's happening there, right? That's one kind of war. Another kind of war though that we see here obviously is between black and white, but then also the whole gender thing and how she was not even seen for who she was, but was seen as a big black man, big black man, and her children pay the cost. War is afoot in so many ways. And this story captures so many dimensions of the war that we're in, the war that we know in faith will one day cease as wars are all swallowed up. And here's a place that takes us deep into the eschatological hope as we look for the end of this world and pray, use music and contemplation to look to the world to come. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Maybe it sounded like that. We don't know, but a pause. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. What fighting in your life can you pause in order to hear God? What fighting in your life is happening? that you can pause participating in. Not that it's a bad conflict even. Maybe it is, as in the case of Sharp. But what is a conflict that you actually can pause from so that you can hear God? In this passage, we see people who are deep in battle. And the beautiful thing about the Psalter is that even though we can't always locate in a spatial way or a temporal way what was happening, those songs live on and they can be used for all kinds of people. And so there's war that was happening for them. They're looking to the God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob, their ancestors, to hold them close. And in the midst of all the worry and the fear and the fighting and the worrying, be still and know that I am God. In contemplative circles, this is a very prominent phrase to use, be still. But when you just say the word, be still, anybody here heard that phrase, be still and know that I'm God? It can often sound very romantic and pastures, you make me lie down beside green pastures and all that. But in this case, it's in the midst of war. Be still in the midst of war. A time, remember, we're thinking Egypt to the south, we're thinking Assyria or Babylon to the north, who knows what's happening. But in this passage, we're thinking about an activity that requires anything but stillness. Of course we fight, of course we wage. And yet here, it's not saying retract so that you're irrelevant but rather be still and wait on the Lord. What fighting in your life can you pause in order to hear God? Last, but certainly not least, is purpose. One of the reasons I started Notes of Rest was because when I was in seminary, I was so dismayed at how people felt like their purpose was being swallowed up in all the decline narratives present about churches in North America. What, our church, we can't keep our lights on, what are we gonna do? And all this pain and just the alarms were going off. The alarms are going off, yo. The alarms, they, they keep going off. It's all good. It's all good, yo. The alarms are going off, and yet we wait on the Lord. Amen. Ooh, that was, that was a plan. We, we 
coordinated that ahead of time. I saw all of the pain. I saw all the confusion. I saw all of the lack of imaginative thinking. I saw clouded purpose. We see in Hebrews 4, this passage is talking about if you stay obedient to God, you stay attentive, that you can actually move into that final rest of God. What, another way to think about that is if you stay clear about your purpose, you can move towards what God has for the community, that final rest of God. This is that eschatological hope coming forth. And so I, just today even, a Sojourner's news piece came to me, and it talked about what the church is going to look like in 2070. There's a big poll that was just done that says the church is probably going to look like, in the U.S. at least, 35 to 64% of people identify as Christian. And it's going to, therefore, quite possibly look like a minority, if not maybe a plurality. And so the question is, do you freak out? You're losing power. You're becoming less relevant to the local fair of the day. Hear these words from this brilliant Africana scholar, Vincent Lloyd. In the minority under duress, Christians will find it easier to access the truth of the faith, commitment to new life, and to a new world. Black Christians have long had the experience of living faithfully as a minority, and all Christians anticipating a future as a minority should turn to the lessons they have gifted the church. The Mother Emmanuel, that deep vulnerability of being a minority, and the death that came, that visited, that continues to visit Black life, time and again, puts us in a position where our sense of faith is always conditioned by this idea of being a minority. This allows us, though, in a place of minority status, to have a clearer sense of our purpose, to move forth, to sing those songs of Zion. I can't wait to play for you in just a second. To play some of these songs from my heritage, to play songs that you know that come from Europe, but I've played and received in my tradition. Ways that speak to how we can use music use contemplation to move us as communities towards the purpose God has for us so that we might enter that final rest of God one day. We don't know how it's all gonna look. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but as Moltmann reminds us, we wait for that coming of God. We don't wait idly, we wait in purpose. We wait imaginatively. We rest in the work that we have to do together, the work that you all are doing in VST and your communities of faith. And so to that, and I want to think a little bit more about art in particular, because art is a place where we're able to tap into the abundance that God has for our communities. Here are these words from Fujimura, who I know is a friend of VST, Mako Fujimura, a beautiful visual artist. This is what he says about Christians. When Christians make, making things like art, we invite the abundance of God's reality into the reality of scarcity all about us. That passage I just read you, Vincent Lloyd is responding to the scarcity thinking that's so prominent now as we realize that the power that we might have once had here in North America is waning for bad and for good. And so as things happen, as things shift, as we become more aware of red airings, of sheep and wolves calling, all kinds of things that are good, salutary benefits of what's happening in this moment, we can become clear about what is the purpose for a place like VST? What does it mean to be in theological education in this moment? What's it mean to sing the songs of Zion now when it's not a given? that everybody in your family is gonna to go to church. These allow us to be resensitized to these questions about faith, about life and mission, about the purpose of fellowship. And so to that end, I have one more question for you, which is in your community of faith, what rhythms of rest is the spirit calling you to strengthen? Remember, we've been talking about rhythms throughout, rhythms of rest that allow us to use music and contemplation to pause for more, to move towards the rhythm of sleep, to embrace the rhythm of limits that can look like death. Not because we are giving over to fatalistic thinking, but because we know death has been swallowed up. We also know that there are rhythms of rest that allow communities to actually pause and take times like the Somerville lecture to pause and have retreats. We can have vacations and sabbaticals. There are all kinds of ways you can answer this question. I encourage you to sit with the spirit and think as I play, what are the rhythms that you could do, not just for your sake, but for those in your care? Because as Exodus reminds us, as Deuteronomy reminds us, when we rest, it's not just for our sake. It is very much for the sake of those around us, humans and non-humans. The livestock that work for you, let them rest, which means also the earth rests. And any farmer will tell you, you have to let the earth rest if you want it to continue to yield. 
And so in time when restlessness of overproduction of overwork is so enshrined, like Pong says, how can you help your community rest? I'm gonna leave these questions open as we go into the concert. And so I'm gonna play and I'm gonna have these questions up here in concert together as well. How does this restless rat race, again, let you define that, tempt you to ignore God's rhythms of rest? I know for me, it's ironic, and I'm saying this to be transparent, I do work about rest, right? And yet I can wake up at night, in the middle of the night, thinking about, hmm, what's Montmont saying on this page? You know, or have I talked about Fujimura enough? Whatever the case is, I can end up being restless about a work about rest. So pray for me, right? The rat race about trying to get ahead, being an entrepreneur, all of this, and y'all know you look at Americans and you pity us, thank you, right? But entrepreneurship in America that can constantly keep us up all night, the Steve Jobs of the world, yes, this affects even me. So this question hits home for me. The rat race is present for me. How can Jesus' coming rest, the one he talks about coming in glory, inform your sleep rhythms and the rhythms of those in your care? I'd love to see a church life where people were talking about sleep honestly and openly. But often, and again, if you struggle with insomnia, you know sleep or struggling to sleep can be a source of shame. How can Jesus' rest that comes, that swallows up victory and allows us all the peace that we need actually open us up to a new conversation about a heat epidemic? Another, what fighting in your life can you pause in order to hear God? All kinds of fights. We love to fight, love conflict, love pain, love to say we're on the right side. Again, at least I'm speaking from the American context. But what fighting in your life can you pause so that you might hear from God? And then let, here we have in your community of faith, what rhythms of rest is the spirit calling you to strengthen? You all are participating in communities and our restlessness begets more restlessness in each other, but our restfulness also begets restfulness in one another. I'm about to play and I pray that it helps you move into the rest that God has. How are you doing that for each other? It might be cooking. It might be serving. It might be reminding people of the goodness of God, of rehearsing what God has done in Jesus and helping people attend, contemplate what God has done. It might be playing radio music softly in the background that reminds people of the God you serve. I don't know what it is for you, but your community of faith needs you to help them rest because the reality is we're up against big challenges. And so here on this, I have the questions on the left and on the right, I have my album cover called Rest Assured. And here you have the bird from Matthew 6. You see here the bird is looking at you. As you look at the bird, let God through this animal look at you and let it be a place, a source to reflect on the abundance that God promises all follow after Jesus. As we wait for the coming kingdom where all rest will come, and all of death will be swallowed up. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your stain? May a picture like this, may this music be a space to help you live out that rhythm of rest now. So we'll play. I'll come back at about 8.30, and then you'll have a chance to talk with each other. Remember, introverts, I told you, an hour, true to my word. So we'll come back in about 25 minutes. You'll talk, and then we'll share together.
God is here. Rhythm, music, contemplation, mystery, receiving, memory, history, suffering, joy, hope, war, peace. God is here and God is coming. Now it's your turn. Now you get to share with each other. How was the last hour and a half? How was it for you? What was coming up for you with these questions, with the sounds, with the images? Talk with your neighbors and then we'll have a chance to come back together and talk. Thank you for being in notes of rest. We're at the banks now. So you all have a chance to talk. I'll just play a little behind you and then we'll get to come back and talk.
All right, take another minute. Wrap up your thoughts. So we'll come back together. Let's, let's come back together. Uh, so great. It's so great to be here. You know, before, before we say anything, I just want to take a, a moment to just be so thankful, you know, just seeing so much of my family back here in the corner, sharing and chatting, meaningful. These cats have been around since No to Rest began. Uh, and when it was just me and like two of us on Zoom, it ought to be me and two of them. And, you know, my parents in Chicago. And so I'm just so thankful that it's gone from those sessions to this. So, so praise God for that. Anyway, that was just a little personal sentimental moment. Ah, artists. Um, now we can come back together and uh, we can now share together just what was, what was happening for you. And I think we have a, a mic to run around so just you can lift your hand and sorry I'm in the zoom I don't know if there's a way to see you or talk on zoom but if people have questions maybe there's a way but at the very least if anybody here has a thought they wanted to share or a question based on the material by all means oh sorry <laughs> sorry the artwork on your uh, album cover, is that yours? Or? Oh, is that mine? No, my friend made that, Shin Mang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't draw like that. Yeah, Shin did it. He's an amazing artist. Yeah. What it, my name's Jacqueline. Um, but what it brought up for me is um, in my church, my my ministers never get a break like it's we we applaud their double time efforts right like we work them until they have pneumonia and everyone's like oh such good workers wow and i'm like uh actually not <laughs> we need to do something about that so Amen. so i so thank you and i'll take that back and try to be a better advocate for their health for their health thank yeah. you amen yeah. and when they are able to rest and have health then everybody will. Um, when I read that, that apparently, I want to read more on that, but apparently the term workaholism was first used with pastors. Man, that was painful to read. So painful. So when you're doing the Lord's work, you know, you can just do it until you can't anymore. And I get it in both ways. I'm kind of right in the middle because not only have I had pastoral experience, I passed to the church and went to seminary and all this. I also am a musician. And musicians are equally as restless and working late, often when they should be sleeping. That's when the world is alive for us when we're making gigs and all this, or traveling and time zones and jet lag, all kinds of things that work against our rest. So you hear you have the go get them passion of the ministry, and then you have the we'll stay out all night and make music for you vibe of the music. So please pray for me, you know, because I get the, the pressure from both sides, but thank you. And for other lady in the room, that's just such a great point that you all can be the protectors. You can be the advocates for rest for the pastors who won't say that because they don't want to be seen as weak. They don't want to be seen as lesser than or lazy. They don't want to, Lord be, you know, God forbid, they don't want to be seen as faithless, right? To Jacqueline's point. And yet we can often work ourselves and work our clergy into the ground. There's a reason there's a five-year burnout these days for so many clergy. There's a reason for that. So notes of rest is here in part in order to help stem some of that tide. Thank you. Thanks. This was great. Um, I'm Aaron. Uh, I was wondering if you would share like some of the rhythms of rest in your own life. I just find it's mm -hmm. helpful to 
know how people manage to do it in the midst of busyness. Amen. Absolutely. Let's see. That's a few slides over, but we'll, uh, yeah, we can just go to that now. So just to recap, you know, this is what we were talking about. We can choose to listen to God's in breaking rhythm of rest over against the world's seductive, destructive rhythms of restlessness. We've talked about various ways we can do that. Um, music and contemplation are ways of practicing that listening in order to care for this restless world, care for ourselves and each other. And Aaron, to your point, what I've started doing is compiling a list based on what people have said, what I do, putting practices up here that you can use, um, that I use. And so a lot of this is, like they say for any advice, just autobiography. Um, but one thing I like to do is practice stillness. So you noticed at the end of the concert, I just sat there. That was a way for me to also kind of regulate and be present to what was happening in me because that was such an intense time, such an intense outpouring. In other situations, I go, all right, you know, and you jump up and you're in it. But what I love about notes of rest retreats is that I can really just pause and give us that space, me included. So there's one. Many other, various other things I do, love playing. Um, and play is a great kind of rest. I love puzzles. Anybody here like puzzles? Oh, yes, somebody looked repulsed, I'm sorry. But yes, I, I love puzzles and I love doing a thousand pieces. And you know, it, it's helpful. That's a, a really helpful kind of rest for me because in music and in this work, so many of the results are intangible. You know, like hopefully y'all rest, but I don't know what's gonna happen. And maybe you reach out, please sign up on the email list. Maybe you reach out, you know, and tell me, hey, this helped change my ministry, Jacqueline, thank you, right? But for the most part, so much of what I do is in this intangible, I can't see it way. But a puzzle, ah, so restful. <laughs> because when a piece fits, it fits. There's no question, no critique, no maybe ifs, ands, or buts. So for other people, it may be the exact opposite, where like my wife, she has anxiety because she's like, ah, I gotta find a piece in the midst of the thousands. She's a doctor, so that's understandable. That, you know, that'd be her concern. But for me, ah, uh, rest and peace in that. So that, that's one thing. I also do a technology-free Sabbath as best I can. So every Sunday, in order to rehearse part of what, you know, Christ is bringing, all the anxiety that my phone represents, put it to the side. And even every morning, I try for a few hours every morning to not even touch my phone, let alone look at it. And in that, it actually helps keep some of that anxiety that the, the phone so easily represents and kind of carries and gloats over. Um, it keeps that at bay. So that screens off on Sundays as best I can, screens off in the morning as best I can. Have a few analog hours for my prayer, my stillness, my silence, my calisthenics. Um, Nelson Mandela, when he was on Robben Island during the imprisonment for decades, he would do this robust calisthenics workout every day. 45 minutes running in place, 100 push-ups, and 200 sit-ups. It wasn't so he could get buff, but it was rather because working out like that helped keep his mind sharp for the work. And he even continued that regimen after he was liberated and, be, um, I guess, once he became president too. So these are practices that I have used and, and learned from greats who practice rest, not only for themselves, but also for others. So thank you for asking that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Will. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just shared in our little talk that uh, I really appreciated the musical time for like a time of rest for myself, like just listening. I felt like we were transported somewhere and we all went there together with you. And I guess it was an intense time for you, but I found it very restful. Praise and, the Lord. Uh, <laughs> Best of God. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And just the other thing I, I liked, because I struggle with sleep right now, and I like that you mentioned that we can find ways to rest, I guess, in music or like while we're awake, while we're doing things, because if, if you can't sleep, then you can't sleep. So. That's, that's a great point. Yes, that's a great point. And insomnia works in that way, you know, where it becomes, it can become its own kind of rhythm. That's why I said rhythm of restlessness. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sensitive to that, very sensitive to that. And yeah, music is something that you can control, you know? And it's one of the scary things when I've struggled with sleep in the past is, man, I know I want to be asleep right now. I'm in bed, I'm doing the things, but I can't will it. And they even have done all these studies on the drugs that people use to medicate and how that can have deleterious effects long-term. So really, sleep is this amazing exercise in grace because you can't force it, really, you know? 
and you're not supposed to force it. You're really supposed to receive it. And yet when you can't receive it, ah! Yeah. So I hear you, I'm with you, and I'm glad that this can be a source of rest. And I should say, Will, to your point, and thank you for that, um, that as, you know, it's important. One of the reasons I like working through the five kinds is because sometimes I've heard people talk about, you need to rest, stop working. And, I, you know, I hear, especially, you know, for Black folks, single mothers, people who have all kinds of responsibilities, that this kind of finger wagging or making people feel guilty is not, it's tone deaf. And it's not accounting for all the systems of injustice that allow for certain people, oftentimes I'm hearing finger wagging from white middle-class men, finger wagging saying, you need a rest. And I'm like, bruh, the last 500 years have been spent creating a system where you out of all people get to rest. And meanwhile, everybody else, women, black folk, otherwise, all of us are working in service to your rest and repose. And so music, contemplation, again, these are resources anybody has access to even if you don't have that day off because of whatever injustice you're up against or because somebody's left you and left you with all kinds of responsibilities, we still always have access. And how do I know it? Mother Emmanuel. How do I know it? Because of Give Me Jesus and all these songs. So, so thank you for that, Will. You're not alone, man. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. We have time for a little, oh yeah. This guy was laughing at all my jokes. So yeah, feel, feel free to ask two questions. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. My name is Ben. It's more just a reflection, I think it'd be nice to hear what you think. I find so often I have opportunities for rest. Mm. They're often there and I resist them. Mm. Like I really, at times I feel my heart hardening against them. Wow. It can be in worship. Um, I'm a musician too can be playing music it can be these different things and it's so hard to just let go of that yeah and I keep thinking of that refrain in exodus about pharaoh's heart hardening mm -hmm. and that keeps going on like a refrain in my brain over and over and over and it's so funny because I you know I, I work as a music director and I teach music and I work as a musician and I'm at a seminary and there's all these lovely people in front yeah. of me and around me and and uh, you know, I'm a straight white male as well, too. And yet there's still this deep mm. resistance against it. And I, yeah, I'm something I'm working on, but. Oh, man, thank you, you know, for sharing I'm that. sure there's other people that feel this at times, too. Yeah, yo. You know, part of the weird irony in this day, unlike in ages past, is that it used to be that when you worked more, you'd make more. So therefore, you'd work less. Right. So actually, if you look at pictures from the Renaissance era of, you know, the naked white women, you know, on the beautiful couches, that's like a very standard picture. Well, they're always very pale on purpose. Right. Because it's a sign of showing that they don't have to be in the fields getting tanned by the sun. Right. Now, though, the reverse seems to be happening. If you work more, you make more. You work more. So you make more. And it just becomes part of this really negative spiral where people just work themselves into the bone because they were successful yesterday. So all to say, I hear you. And I can struggle with that too. Again, not trying to be, you know, I'm all, I got it all together. Because I see passion, I see joy, I see the need, right? You can do all these things. And again, workaholism for pastors working themselves into pneumonia. Being aware of the fact that you actually don't want to receive the gift that God has for you, that's a great place to start. Take that to God. If that's you, and you actually don't want to receive rest because there's something tied up in your identity, in work, in production, and whatever it is, that's a great place to start. God, meet me here. Because honestly, I want to keep going. Part of what knocks me on my behind is when I think about the fact that God on the seventh day decided to stop not because God was tired. That's part of what we do to anthropomorphize God. Oh, God must have been tired. He just made human. Um, it doesn't say that. It just says that God decided to stop and rest. So if God can stop and rest, Israel, Julian, Ben, if God can stop, how about us? Brueggemann in his book, Sabbath as Resistance, remember I was talking that Brueggemann loves to think in terms of systems. He's really big on economic and political systems in the Old Testament and looking at how these systems can either work towards peace and justice and shalom, the wholeness of people, or work against. 
one thing he notes is that God was able to pause after day six and the world kept going. The earth kept moving. He, the earth didn't go back into the watery abyss, you know, Tehon of Genesis 1. Somehow God was able to pause and things stayed afloat. And yet part of my God complex is if I don't answer an email, <laughs> that's my whole career, I, I'm done, right? I can't trust that creation is good. I can't trust that systems would ever work in my favor. I have to have my hand always in something. And so part of my work daily and keeping my phone away, right? Knowing that there are emails there waiting, knowing that there's this and that, is actually to try to practice some of that posture of the Lord who even rested. That ends up being a good news rehearsal to me daily. And so I just share that with you in solidarity, knowing just how hard it is and how much we can often feel like, I don't want to rest. I may even have that day off or what have you, but let me, let me figure out if I can tinker with something, right? And just then perpetuate more restlessness for us and then others, because others are watching, others see. Oh, he was on his email during vacation. Well, I probably can do that too, right? I like Ben. He's like, he's really getting ahead, man. He's a great cat, can play in and, and school. So if he's doing it, shoot, right? And that's how perpetual restlessness begets more of it, where we model and then even give it to others. So thank you for sharing honestly. So as when we spoke a while ago, you know that uh, gospel music is near and dear mm. to my heart. And But I'd never really considered it really contemplative mm. music. Um, so this is the first time with your invitation that I could receive it as such. And uh, it was quite moving and lovely for me. And the, um, and the contrast, the fact that you were playing, it was quite busy. Like if you're getting paid by the note, I hope you are, because there are a lot of notes. And, um, and yet it was very, it was a place of almost like being in an ocean. There's a mm. lot of power, there's a lot of something going on, but I'm, we could be still in the midst of it. That was quite powerful. The other point I was thinking is I'd never really thought about keeping Sabbath as an invitation. Mm. Um, it was a law, I guess. And to think of it as more of an imitation was something I hadn't considered. Mm. I think partly in the, in the evangelical tradition, there's this idea, well, Jesus is a Sabbath, so we don't have to keep the law, mm. so don't worry about it. Go yeah. ahead and work on Sunday. It doesn't matter. I realized, wow, we're really missing it with that. Wow. So thank, thank you. you. Man, beautiful, beautiful point that, yeah, Jesus is a, it, and look how Jesus violated Sabbath. He fed people, right? He went and picked up stocks and the disciples ate. We ain't got to keep that, you know? Let's keep to work. And there's all kinds of relationships between, and Max Weber writes about this in, uh, in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism and how there's a, a kind of, maybe you can even call it neuroses that ends up developing in the founding fathers, this is again, the American context, um, around trying to work out their salvation that was connected to the spirit of work, which then led to a certain kind of economic system and conventional logic um, that we still war with today. And so I thank you for noting that. And that's something I'm trying to think more and more about. How can we actually lean into the invitation, the gift of rest, and not see it as a law that can, you can use to bludgeon people. You're not keeping it right. You're out. But rather use it as a means for the freedom of God that Jesus has come to present and come to usher us into. So thank you for saying that line. Friends, I hope you'll join me in saying thank you uh, to Julian for this evening. Uh, your, your presentation and the wonderful music that you played, I think maybe for some of us, just the ability to sit still for 20 minutes and to listen to something that's moving and inviting and restful and to draw us into those rhythms is just a great gift to us. Um, I was thinking of what to say at the end and I remembered my experience in church and I want to uh, offer a blessing by wishing you all a quiet night and a perfect rest. <laughs>